casual sex is by far one of the most pervasive myths of modern society. As a matter of fact, it is in some sense central to the contemporary trend of completely emancipating oneself from nature through technological means. Right off the bat, it is important to make it clear that casual sex as a concept has never existed in the history of humanity. That this concept is purely Western and can only be discussed in the context of modern socio-political state. Now, I'm not arguing that people had never engaged in commitment-free intercourse prior to contemporary society. It's just the concept and the thought underlying this notion are novel and unique to a specific technological and temperamental environment that came into existence in the 20th century West. Now, let's define the meaning and message of this notion. The official definition of casual sex, then, is sexual activity between people who are not established sexual partners or do not know each other well. The underlying message of this notion is that people should or could base their sexual decisions on the principle of bodily autonomy. In other words, the concept of casual sex is an attempt to emancipate an individual from the shackles of cultural determinism and social responsibility. In a typical traditionalist society, someone's body doesn't belong to that particular person. The reason, first and foremost, is that there is no such thing as a particular person in a traditionalist society. Rather, personhood is enmeshed into the social fabric and cultural matrix, whereby one has to engage in a reciprocal relationship with their surroundings. Hence, in a traditional society, one is semi-autonomous with regard to the physical body. Looking through a magnifying glass, one's behavior might look isolated, but if you zoom out a bit, you would see that a citizen of a traditional society is a servo mechanism of the state. So in ancient Athens, for example, according to Aristotle, you gain the fruit of individuality only if you are part of a polis. If you are outside the polis, you are either an animal or a god. Being the polis then means sharing the responsibilities and core values of the state. Now, the concept of casual sex would oppose this old and dried out conception of the body politic. One's sexuality is not a playground of the state, culture, family or relatives, says the free thinker of modern society. Here we get to the core presuppositions that need to be true for casual sex to be a legitimate concept. Human beings are or can be fully autonomous beings, both physically and psychologically as they are fully able to divorce sexuality from the sphere of emotionality and mental health. One's decision-making about personal sexuality is safe enough to do away with cultural traditions and customs. Sexual intercourse is not that big of a deal, as evidently it can be casual if one desires it to be. This negates the notion that humans are evolutionary wired to act in a certain way. There are no inherent differences between men and women. Therefore, they are both equally able to engage in casual sex. Now, first we need to consider that casual sex is in and of itself an oxymoron. Uh, the definition of the word casual sounds as follows. Relaxed or unconcerned. So, sex apparently, which is a foundational act of reproduction, a foundational element of biological evolution, a critical part of cultural evolution and part and parcel of human psychosocial formation and mental health, can simply be relaxed or unconcerned. Now, there is nothing necessarily impossible about it, but it is highly unlikely, to say the least. So here are five major problems that I see in the concept of the casual sex. Sex can never be divorced from other human faculties. Hence, in virtue of sexual activity overlapping with other vital spheres of existence, it can never be casual. Casual sex promotes the false illusion of being in charge of one's body, and having full autonomy over one's psyche and unconscious. Casual sex, in virtue of its being contrary to one's evolutionary predispositions, damages one's mental health. Casual sex contributed to social disorganization and the loss of unifying social fabric, without which there can never be such thing as culture or state. Society that accepts casual sex as a norm will inevitably create an environment that will or does already benefit people with antisocial personalities. Let's begin with the first one. Right from the outset, the very idea that sex can be completely isolated from other human activities and vital spheres of being demonstrates the mass prosopognosia that I discussed in another video. You see, human life is not segmented into isolated chunks of behavioral modalities that can be accessed like different shelves of a wardrobe. 
Rather, sexuality is interlinked with mental health, emotional attachment, love, self-assessment, the ability to sustain long-term relationships, cognitive abilities, and surely with physical health. The idea that one can be sure and calm that a casual one-nighter can never affect one's overall being is a symptom of psychological fragmentation. One is unable to see him or herself as one whole human being with core guiding principles that will influence every aspect of his behavior. In other words, modern people have lost the sense of identity principle. They do not live in the modality of being, but have entered into pure becoming. This perpetuates an illusion that one can engage in an act that will be abstracted or cut out from the contextual web of one's being. I'm going to have a one-nighter, and that act of casual sex will have no long-lasting impact on my life, as I'm free to think that it won't affect me. This brings me to the second problem. The idea that one's unconscious or psyche is so accessible and malleable is preposterous. The whole idea of psychoanalysis, which is, after all, a foundational principle of psychology, is that you are not a master of your psyche. The very existence of a psychologist as a profession presupposes that your psyche is not fully accessible to you. You can use your body the same way you can use your computer, but you don't actually know what is going on behind the scenes. The false notion of casual sex that causes the bloating of confidence in one's sexual decision-making places a Sisyphus tone on people's shoulders. All of a sudden one decides that culturally devised schemas that organize one's life into a meaningful storyline are obsolete. Now I will be the storyteller and the storymaker of my life, says the modern army of Sartre's illegitimate children, or bastards if you will. Well, no you won't. Maybe you could give it another thought before adopting such an arrogant position. What are the chances that you are going to come up with a better sexual lifestyle, which is, by the way, everything but a style, as it has no structure, than the way it was pursued in most successful cultures that have ever existed? Maybe there is more to the values of sexual abstinence than just the pure bigotry of religious extremists. Somehow we came to believe that sexual life, unlike food, technology, education, jobs, and other everyday activities, can be something that is completely and utterly self-governed. I mean, ideally, if you structure what you eat, how you exercise, how you conduct yourself in public, how you do your job at the workplace, and so on and so forth, why on earth would you think that sex is somehow exempt from rules and standards? The third point was about mental health. Studies show that females are especially susceptible to mental health injuries when engaging in casual sex, which in and of itself shows that it is more than casual. The use of antidepressants is correlated with the advent of the sexual revolution. The thing about it is that reward or short-term pleasure trumps contentment, and that's why one needs antidepressants. Dopamine is what gives you pleasure, and serotonin is what gives you contentment. People who base their life on hedonism can never be content, as dopamine production runs contrary to serotonin. And constant chase of stimulation echoes my previous point about how pure becoming and flux have substituted being and self-identity. Unfortunately, you can't have both. You are either constantly chasing pleasure, and hence you are constantly unhappy, or you are mentally stable and content and give away short-term bursts of physical pleasure. The fact that females are more susceptible to mental health issues when it comes to casual sex is expected. How on earth would a female sustain continual engagement in casual sex in a world where contraception never existed? Why is it so unimaginable that one's evolutionary stable strategy of reproductive behavior is ingrained in the central nervous system? After all, 80% of genes are expressed in the nervous system. Further, studies showed that when people have more than two sexual partners, their chances of building a monogamous family significantly decreases, which proves the point that sex can never be divorced from other spheres of being. And the fact that this leads to the deconstruction of family structures brings me to the fourth problem. The notion of casual sex disregards the principle of the social fabric. And what's most fascinating about it is that most proponents of casual sex are people who call themselves leftists. Now, the reason why this is so stupid and ironic is that the whole point of leftism and leftist social analysis is that unlike neoliberal or liberal theories, it conceives society as a matrix rather than as an organization of atomized individuals. 
the neoliberal capitalist conception of society, is that there is no such thing as a society, but only individuals. This is backed by Hobbes' understanding of society, which is expressed in the illustration of Leviathan, where instead of relations, we see a collection of individual heads. On the other hand, leftist social theories tend to conceive society as a superorganism that cannot be reduced to its individual parts, which explains why sociology is a relatively leftist-dominated discipline. The wall is more than just a collection of bricks, as it has properties that are lacking in a single brick. The key to creating a wall or any complex structure lies in the unique relationships between its individual components, rather than in a mere assembly of their numerical quantities. If you just throw bricks in one place, you won't get any type of structure, as the latter presupposes uniform and fixed patterns of interrelations. And this then brings me to my point. What kind of society as a superorganism will come out from bricks that do not stand in fixed positions with each other, but are rather free to move the way they want? Which house do you prefer, the one where each part of the house is free to form any rhizomatic connections, or the one that is organized like a tree and has fixed relations? Hence, the society where sexual relations has no structure is not a society anymore, the same way a wall, where bricks are not organized in a specific fashion, is not a wall anymore, but rather a pile of disconnected bricks that looks like a midden hip. Again, any counter-argument to this point, backed up by examples of societies that didn't practice standard monogamy, would miss the point. The problem with the modern notion of free sex is not necessarily the absence of monogamy or Puritan Christian ethics, but rather the absence of structure as such. After all, Plato, who is not your average liberal hippie, advocated the communal sharing of wives in his ideal society. However, in that case, it served a greater goal of creating a strictly regulated society whose overall structure and purpose was everything but a sexually liberated paradise. And lastly, the notion of casual sex serves as a gateway to psychopathic social tendencies. The idea that you can engage in a tactile relationship with someone for quite some time without forming any emotional attachment is scary, to say the least. It's like I'm having sex with your carcass, not with you. It just so happened that you are just wearing that body that I happen to like at that moment. Modern society treats the human body as an inanimate object that one wears, carries, flexes, or advertises. I mean, the whole notion of the body belonging to someone presupposes the scary distinction of personhood and physicality. It's not that you are your body, but rather your body belongs to you like a Gucci bag or a laptop. I mean, there's a reason why males are better at casual sex. The reason is that males are better at dehumanizing other people. This dehumanization then happens by virtue of more brain differentiation, whereby one is able to divorce different segments of life from one another. Males have more front-to-back brain activity, whereas females have more integrated hemispheres and hence more lateral connections between hemispheres. This is why the left hemisphere of masculine intellect is of hair-splitting rationality, hyper-focus, corpuscularity, and of detail attention, whereby the left hemisphere is unable to see the whole. On the other hand, the feminine right hemisphere approach is of wholeness. The right hemisphere tries to integrate and see similarities as opposed to differences. It's worth noting that males are on average more likely to be left-brainers than females let alone considering the fact that males are more likely to be psychopaths too. Hence the inability of females to dehumanize and divorce sexual acts from emotions creates chronic stress and anxiety. On the other hand, males who are psychopathic and narcissistic thrive in such circumstances as they are best in the act of dehumanization. Hence, masculinized feminists who are committed to the goal of proving males that they can also be psychopathic are ultimately benefiting those narcissistic males who are going to exploit gullible females. The very gullible females who were conditioned to think that they have the same power of divorcing sexuality from emotions. The controversy surrounding the outgrowth of this society and its loverboy method has sparked some revival of psychology in leftist communities, Turns out, after all, that females are not benefiting from the culture of sexual wildness. Actually, this parallels communism and Soviet Union. 
there is a notion in the Marxist community that one of the reasons why the Soviet Union ushered into genocidal totalitarianism is because the power was shifted from Leninist and Trotskyist lines of socialism to Stalinism. The argument goes that if a normal person like Trotsky had the power instead of the bloodthirsty Stalin, Soviet Union wouldn't have been such a failure. The problem with this perspective parallels the pathology of the culture of casual sex. The world and environment that orthodox communism sets forth, irrespective of its primary motivations, will inevitably benefit people like Stalin, which will turn this society into a totalitarian state. There is a reason why it didn't work in South America or in Mao China. The initial programming of a society doesn't tell you how it is going to end up in the future. The reason is that there are lots of variables that one doesn't see in the beginning. This brings us to the inherent disjunction of intellectual projectivity and what type of results your notions might bring about that you initially couldn't have accounted for. Now it's just a matter of time before egalitarian, communitarian supporters of free sex start to challenge and criticize sexual freedom, as the algorithm of casual sex will ultimately benefit psychopathic, harem-possessing, barbarian, narcissistic, quote-unquote, alpha males who are probably not what supporters of free sex imagined in the first place. So all in all, the notion of casual sex is in essence self-referential. Casual sex as a signifier doesn't point to anything real that actually takes place in the physical realm. Contrary to widely held opinion, casual sex doesn't represent something bodily, instinctive or organic. As a matter of fact, however counterintuitive it might sound, casual sex is one of those most abstract and hyper-rational concepts of modern society. Casual sex is a perfect triangle or a rectangle that you would never encounter in a curvilinear, non-mathematical, observable world. The fact that one has sex and then decides to call it casual doesn't make it casual, the same way calling a dog's tail a leg won't make it five-legged. Generally, if I ever engage in something casual, I'm not writing articles or books about it, trying to defend and justify my actions. You can argue that casual sex isn't immoral, or it is not in fact unhealthy. But saying that it is casual means that you either never had it, or you are completely desensitized to it, thanks to pornography and hookup culture. Calling an inability to structure your sexual life, free sex or casual sex, reminds me of Nietzsche's pale criminal from Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Nietzsche conceives a criminal who has committed a murder and then stole something, so that he could somehow explain his behavior. This poor fellow believed he had murdered for the sake of robbing, but in this particular case, it was an afterthought by which he tried to justify the murder in the eyes of his poor reason. He must have a purpose, but as a matter of fact, he didn't have any purpose except the act of murder. Nietzsche is concerned here with the difference between the conscious intention and the subconscious and substantive motif. A pale criminal is someone who is not able to fully accept his deed, which is purely free of theoretical or moral context, and has to rationalize or conceptualize it retroactively. Hence, the pale criminal is a transitional entity from an idealistically loaded human of the metaphysical age and of an obermensch who is free from the notions of good and evil. Modern advocate of casual sex resembles the pale criminal, as actually such a person experiences an inner conflict and tension. On the one hand, he engages in social deviance, and on the other, he's still not able to do it without an afterthought and subsequent evangelism of other people. I have never met more evangelistic and apologetic people than those who defend the notion of free sex. Idealistically, such a person should be chill and relaxed, who won't even care about public perception. However, it turns out that casual sex brings forth not just an afterthought of Nietzsche's pale criminal, but whole mental gymnastics of rigorous logic and Aristotelian argumentation. Well, if you are already duped into thinking that you can have such a lifestyle without serious consequences, at least enjoy it without turning into a mouth-foaming apologist. Okay, so guys, I have looked at your questions and I'll definitely answer them when I get comfortable with the camera. As always, I want to thank my Patreons for their support. If you want to support the channel, you can find the link to Patreon in the description. Thank you again and stay tuned.